Now we're gonna welcome our brother Mitch to the pulpit. We appreciate you and we enjoy having you in our high school group. And now we're gonna go and pray over the Lord. Heavenly Father, we exalt you. And thank you for loving us and mercy. And God, we pray today that you would would reach down and touch our hearts. God, let your word speak into our lives, Master. We pray an anointing upon our ears and our hearts to receive, God, what you desire for us to know. God, that it would be planted in our hearts, that your word, God, would, would be planted deep in our hearts and grow, Master, into, into what you desire it to be. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And put your hands together for the Lord today. to Caleb and Anna, our hyphen leader, give me the opportunity to speak today. Yes. I'd like to give honor to pastor as well and bishop, great men of God, that led me to walk this life and have allowed me to be in this position today. I appreciate you. I know we prayed a lot, but I just want us to pray again. Uh, I just want us to pray that we can let anything that is keeping us from getting in the presence of God to get to for us to repent so that we can walk in his life today and that we can receive the message that he right. has for us today. Amen. But Paul said that he had to die daily. Yes. So what I want us to do is to lift up our voice and for us to repent today so that we can receive what he has for us. Lord God, I pray that you come into this place today. Hallelujah. I pray that you lift up this church and this in this message, Lord, anoint my body from the top of my head to the sole of my feet, that I may be able to preach the word unto these people today, Lord. Anoint us and anoint this message, Lord. Bless this body that has come to hear my voice today, and lift us up in your word and in your presence. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. You may be seated. something, but you know, you think you want it and then it finally arrives and you're just like, wait, I never thought I'd get this far. That's kind of how I got this opportunity to preach. <laughs> <laughs> Caleb texted me. He's like, hey, you want to preach a five, seven minute message? I said, well, some of my topics that I have in mind that are a little longer than that. He said, okay, my brother's coming to preach. He'll be there, but he'll just be the backup preacher in case something bad happens. I was like, deal. Did you not an hour later he texts me, yeah, my brother's not coming, you got the full thing. I was like, whoa, okay. I'll do it. <laughs> I was struggling to find a topic. I actually have a list of topics on my phone. Things that would just come to me at certain times, I'd write them down. And over the past year, I've probably collected 10 or 15 topics, added scriptures into them and things like that. So I figured, you know, why don't I pop, pop that list out, look through it, see what I got. Well, uh, you know, sometimes God doesn't speak to you, but you just have a feeling whenever you're going through a situation. I looked through that list, and I just couldn't find anything that I liked. And so I went to the, I went to the Word of the Lord, of course, read a lot of Old Testaments and New Testament, and I couldn't find anything either. So I went back to the list, and I found that I had missed a little four-word phrase that I had written in there. And see, all my topics had scriptures, they were developed. But this wasn't developed, it was just a four-letter phrase that I had missed when I was scrolling through you know, God's got a sense of humor. Of course, he's going to have me pick the one that doesn't right. have any development. It doesn't have anything to go off of. But I believe he's got something powerful in store for us today. Amen. Yeah. Uh, so I'd like to bring your attention to Psalms 27, verse 1. I may come back to the rest of the chapter, but for now, we'll just focus on verse 1. So David wrote, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Man. And so I have simply titled my message today, Whom Shall I Fear? Right. right. Turn to your neighbor and say, Fear. Fear. 
Now, a few is an interesting thing. Uh, people describe it as an unpleasant feeling or emotion, and most people do everything they can to avoid it. Uh, we'll, we'll try anything to escape it. Uh, however, there are some few that actually seek it out. Uh, you could sometimes call, these, sometimes call these people adrenaline junkies. Maybe they go skydiving. Maybe they go scuba diving. Uh, I, I may fall into this category. Personally, I like to go cliff jumping a lot. I did that a lot this summer. And uh, sometimes fear is justifiable, uh, and sometimes it's not justifiable. Right. You know, if you're skydiving and your parachute doesn't deploy, there you go. That, that's justifiable. There's a reason you should be afraid. <laughs> but sometimes you'll watch a scary movie. Maybe you're watching Freddy Krueger. Maybe you're watching Friday the 13th. Uh, now, there's no reason to be afraid of that because it's not real. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes we still feel scared even though, even though we shouldn't. Although, I would argue that sometimes experiencing fear is a good thing. Because it keeps us alive. You know, if you didn't feel any fear and you're, par and you're skydiving and your parachute didn't deploy <laughs> and all you do is shrug your shoulders, <laughs> then you may be in, a, in for a problem. Yeah. But not only is it interesting, and sometimes it's a good thing, uh, but it's a powerful thing too. So powerful, in fact, that it can change the way you think. It can change the decisions you make. Right. And it can change the way you act. Uh, sometimes this is known as like the, the fight or flight response. Right. right. So when the body is threatened or the brain feels threatened, the amygdala, which is responsible for processing emotions, will send signals to the rest of your body to prep yourself for confrontation. It's going to elevate your heart rate. Your breathing is going to elevate so you have more oxygen. Your glucose levels are going to spike so you have more energy. Uh, sometimes people will even say they have super strength and agility when they have the fight or flight response. I remember I read a book about a boy soldier from Africa who was recruited at the age of 10 when his village was raided. And he said that the first time his village got attacked, he had never run so far and so fast in his life. Mm. And that wasn't because he was a good athlete. It wasn't because he had some superhuman lungs, but it was because he was under attack and he had that fight or flight response. So what it does is it prepares you for confrontation. Now sometimes we're gonna find ourselves in these positions. We're gonna have, find ourselves in these positions where we feel that fight or flight response. And sometimes we're gonna feel fearful. We're gonna feel helpless or hopeless. However, and you know, sometimes that's natural because after all, uh, we're only human. And that's part of our, who we are. It's part of our nature. It's our primal instinct to ensure self-preservation when our well-being is at stake. But what I want you to know is that there is a difference between living in fear and right. experiencing fear. Right. And see, what I think is some of you have deceived yourself into thinking that you are only experiencing fear when really you are living in fear. Right. And what God does not desire for us is to live in fear. He does not want us that, want us to have that, but rather what he wants us to have is peace. Right. And so if you find yourself living in fear, know that God is not forsaking you. God is with you and that you need to look the adversary in the face. You need to ask him, whom shall I fear? Right, right. See, what I want you to do is distinguish those two types of fear found in the Bible. There's earthly fear and there's godly fear. Now, earthly fear, that's going to be what triggers that fight or fight response. There's going to be a physical present situation. You know, maybe you're in a financial situation that you don't feel you can overcome. Maybe you have a cancer in your body. Maybe there's some sort of disease that you feel like you cannot come overcome. Maybe you find yourself in a life-threatening situation. You have a gun pointed at your head. Maybe you even just have a phobia. I was actually curious when I was doing my research. I looked up what are the most common phobias around the world. And the top three were arachnophobia, mm. aphidiophobia, and macrophobia, mm. being of spiders, snakes, and heights. However, earthly fear is not something that God wants for us. And some people want to think that that is what God gives us. But that is not what he gives us. What he gives us is the spirit of peace. Yeah. For 10, 2 Timothy 1 and 7 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And see, what I believe is that many of you are being consumed by earthly fear. 
You mm -hmm. feel as though that is what you've had for a long time and you have become distant from your relationship with God. And what I want to challenge you today is that you need to get into the presence Amen. of the right. Lord. Right. Because right. when you do that, something powerful begins Amen. to change. There's something powerful begins to change the atmosphere in which you live. Right. And that when you, whenever the devil comes against you, you're not going to be fearful anymore. Right. But what you're going to do is you're going to look him in the eye and ask him, whom shall I be? Right. See, what God wants us to have is he wants us to have godly fear. It's commonly referred to as the fear of the Lord right. in the Bible. True. And one could, uh, one could argue that almost every influential person in the Bible has a fear of the Lord. So from Moses, Noah, Abraham, David, all the way to the 12 disciples. Now what is it? Because sure they say the fear of the Lord, but the definition that they're saying, that they're using in fear is not what we think of when we say fear. See, from what I've read, I would kind of more to a sort of respect for God. Maybe like right. a, a yearning to be with him, to follow his word, and to serve his kingdom. See, and the Bible describes that as something good. Something we should pursue. Right. right. And strive for and walk with God. Matter of fact, I would argue that the only way to be holy is to have the fear of the Lord in your life. For 2 Corinthians 7, 1 says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of the Lord. Right. But not only will it help you be holy, but it will help your body live long and your spirit endure. For Psalm 19, 9 says, The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. Proverbs 10, 27, The fear of the Lord prolongeth days. But the years of the wicked shall be shortened. Right. See, so some of you have earthly fear. Mm. And it, actually, matter of fact, you, all you have is earthly fear. You don't have any godly fear mm. in your life. And see, what you need to do is you need to get some godly fear in your life. And when you seek out the Lord, he's going to let the fear of the Lord fall upon you. And whenever that happens, the earthly fear is going to start to subside. And so now when you confront these situations, you're no longer going to feel fearful, but you're going to feel confident in the Lord. Right. And see, what some of us don't realize is that the fear of the Lord will help you conquer your earthly fear. Well, how do you conquer fear? You have to confront it and overcome it. You know, if you go into a psychologist with a phobia, they're not going to let you sit and cower in the corner. They're going to make you confront that fear. They're going to expose it to you. So you have a fear of needles. What they're going to do is they're going to sit you down. And maybe they're going to put you next to a table. And they'll just put that needle. Let's say you're afraid of needles. They're going to put that needle on the table. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're going to get scared. Maybe your heart rate's going to go up. Maybe, maybe you're going to get anxious. But eventually it's going to subside. And you're going to realize that the situation you're in really isn't that bad. Maybe the next day they come in. They're going to take the cap off the needle. They're going to put it on the table. Maybe you're going to get scared a little more. Because that's changing from what yesterday was. See, what they're doing is they're breaking it down into smaller chunks so you can slowly progress up until you take a shot. And see, what they're exposing you to and what they're showing you is that the thing that you feared is actually not as powerful as you thought it was. Does somebody see what I'm trying to say here? The, the adversary that is knocking on your door is not as powerful as you think he is. And so what they're going to do, it, you know, you're going you're gonna to show up. You're going to show up as a psychologist, you're going to be hunched over. You're going to be walking in with your head looking down. And when you walk out of there, you're going to be, you're going to be having a, a straight back. You're going to be looking up high. Right. And so whenever you face that phobia again, you're not going to run in fear, but you're going to be able to stand up to it. And right. see, when you get in the presence of the Lord, sure, you, maybe you're going to be hunched over. Maybe that's how you came in today. But I promise you, when you come out of this service, you're going to be standing tall. You're going to be walking high. Right. And so whenever the adversary comes against you, all you got to do is ask them, whom shall I fear? Right. In order to confront and overcome your fears, you have to have a few things. You have to have knowledge, wisdom. Humility. See, with the knowledge, you're going to know what your fear is. With the wisdom, you're going to know, you're going to have the instruction of how to overcome that fear. And with the humility, you're going to be able to admit that you're afraid. And I think it's interesting that the fear of the Lord gives you all these things. Mm. Proverbs 1 and 7, 1 and 7 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. 
The fool despised wisdom and instruction. Proverbs 15, 33, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom, and before honor is humility. In Proverbs 22 and 4, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. See, some of you have the knowledge and the wisdom, but you don't have, you don't have the humility. You can't admit that you're afraid. You're the, the pride that is inside of you is preventing you from furthering your relationship right. with God. Come on. Right. And so what I'm asking you to do is to admit that you're afraid. Because when you admit that you're afraid, you are allowing somebody else to take over the situation. You are allowing God to take over the situation. And when you allow God to take over the situation, something powerful begins to happen. You know, something that you could not do is now possible. Something that was not able to be done in a human nature is now to be done in a supernatural nature. Now, if you're familiar with the story of Noah, after Adam and Eve had populated the world, God looked upon the earth and he found that all of man had evil and wickedness in their hearts. Matter of fact, the only person who found grace in the sight of the Lord was Noah. It's actually never stated that Noah's family found grace in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is just a personal belief of mine. It was my belief that on the behalf of Noah, God saved his family. Much like how Abraham pleaded with God for Sodom and Gomorrah. He was able to essentially bargain with God down to ten righteous people. He will save two cities of people. Some of you are having somebody plead on your behalf. Right. Right. That's the truth. But you're not walking the path that you need to be walking. Mm -hmm. But that can only go on for so long. That, that, that's not an infinite thing. Right. And so what you have to do is you have to pursue your own relationship. You have, right. to, you have to pursue right. your own walk. Now after God found that Noah was good, commanded him to build the ark, him and his family embarked along with two of every beast, every cattle, everything that creepeth upon the earth. And the waters began to rise. And it rained 40 days, 40 nights. And everything on the earth was killed. See, now he was on the boat for just a little while. Matter of fact, he was on the boat for a little over a year. And now, when I was reading this, I couldn't help but think that, although it isn't stated, Noah may have had a little earthly fear in his situation. You know, because just think about, he, he's stuck where he is. And when he looks out, it's just an ocean of darkness. There's nothing he can see. You know, and he's surrounded by the adversary, almost, you could say. <clears throat> and he was in the storm... And I feel as though many of you are in the same position. Uh, you feel as though you cannot move just like Noah could move. And when you look around, all you see is an ocean of fear. All you see is darkness because you have been living in fear for so long. <clears throat> and although you may feel as though you're surrounded, uh, you cannot move. Uh, God is with you, and so what he's going to enable you to do is he's going to enable you to change your circumstances, right? You see, because some of you feel as though everywhere you go, you are getting backed up against the wall, and you don't have anywhere to run. Everywhere you go, a door is getting shut in your face. The adversary has come to you, and he has cut you off by the knees, and you mm. cannot escape. Right. And see, what the Lord comes in is he shows you that there is a way out. Right. Yep. And that if you follow him, he can bring you salvation. Amen. And see, when the waters finally subsided, uh, Noah and his family, they disembarked as long as well as all the creatures that came with them. And he looked around and he saw that everything was dead. He's like, well, Mitchell, how do you know this? You weren't there. Well, Genesis 7, 23 says every living substance was destroyed, which was upon the face of the ground. 
So just imagine everything is dead when he steps out. Right. All he sees is death and destruction. But the Bible says something powerful about what Noah did after he got off of the ark. For Genesis 8 and 20 says, And Noah built an altar right. unto the Lord. Right. And so what you mean to tell me is that after wading through the ocean of darkness, after wading through the storm, and after he steps out of the boat, and all he sees is death and destruction, you're telling me that he built an altar. The first thing he did was praise the Lord, no matter what his situation was. And see, what I feel like is that many of you are in a storm right now. Many of you feel like you are surrounded by an ocean of darkness. And instead of cowering in fear, what you need to do is you need to get up and you need to praise the Lord. You need to, you need to lift his voice up, right? You need to lift yourself up out of the storm. Because this will allow you to overcome the situation you are in. It will allow you to pursue that relationship with God. Because when you're in the middle of a storm and you're cowering in fear, you decide to worship. Something powerful begins to happen inside you. Something changes in your spirit. And so when the devil tries to remind you of where you are, when the adversary tries to remind you of the things that are that are all surrounding you, all you have to do is ask him, whom shall I fear? Mm. Musicians can come. Okay, look.